Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of our Killer Content Showcase Series. I'm Alicia Esposito, Content Strategist for Demand Gen Report, and I have joining me today Coleman Murphy of Xerox. To kick off our conversation, I'd love for you to um, share a little bit of the inspiration behind your uh, Killer Content award-winning campaign, um, Digitization at Work. What were your ultimate goals that you were trying to achieve with the campaign? All right, so the, the uh, target audience that we were going after with this was Fortune 5,000 corporations around the world. This was a global campaign. And uh, the product offering or part of portfolio that we were, uh, we were selling is our managed print services contracts, our MPS. Um, and for most of these companies, they already have an MPS contract in place. So we're looking to either um, retain existing customers or acquire new logos, so win new business. Um, and the, the approach, the strategy was to position Xerox as the partner of choice to demonstrate uh, why ultimately you should do business with Xerox. Yeah, and what I found really the most compelling about this campaign, and of course, what, what made you guys get, win a uh, Finney Award was the fact that, um, you know, it not just was multi-touch, so it expanded across a lot of different channels. It was, you know, your ability to design this really core survey and then find really um, compelling ways to break down, reuse, and repurpose the content for different formats. Um, so I love your thoughts into, you know, why you thought this was a ideal approach for your audience and, of course, the goals that you were trying to achieve. All right. Yeah. So, uh, frankly, the uh, the survey itself was a little bit self-serving. We we wanted to learn more about our customers and prospects. What were the business challenges that they were dealing with? What were their uh, key drivers? And especially within the the broader frame framework of digital transformation, but our specific segment of that being trying to understand what were the challenges they were having around paper-based activities within their organizations. Um, and a big piece of that was ensuring that we were there to help those customers make that transition from paper-based to digital ways of working. Uh, so it, it, you know, the, the whole spirit of the, of the campaign, but also our MPS strategy is helping customers print less and over time transition out of printing completely and focus on automating business processes. So the survey was a way for us to find out more about the maturity of those customers in that, in that specific uh, space. Obviously, we, we, when we used an outside uh, consulting firm, we understood that we were going to produce something that was of value to our customers as well. Um, when we when we got the actual results back, we were like, wow, there's, there's great information here. And it is information that has value, um, i.e. that it could be gated is really what it comes down to. Um, and that's where the, the, uh, the program started to evolve from being just doing a survey and having it gated and you know, encouraging people to download it to really being the anchor piece for a much broader campaign. Uh, and also for, for those uh, people connecting who aren't familiar with this, this was the first time that Xerox did a fully integrated global campaign for managed print services. Um, so it was, uh, it was a big transition for us. And it was, you know, it was great that we had that piece that we felt like had enough value to, um, to carry a full campaign globally. Yeah, that's great. And I, and I love seeing all the different examples from within the campaign um, because, you know, they all lend themselves well to different promotional channels. They all kind of highlight some unique angle or, you know, bite-sized piece of the survey. Mm -hmm. So it gives people just, just enough, like a little enough taste to intrigue them, um, but then also drive them, like you said, to you know, submit their information, um, you know, raise their hand, so to speak, and get that full report. Um, but I can't help but wonder, Coleman, um, when you were figuring out how to dissect and you know, break down the content for these different promotional and uh, amplification channels, um, how did your target audience come into play when figuring out what formats to focus on and, of course, you know, what amplification channels to focus on? Because it, it of course, varies, you know, depending on who the buyer is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the, the good thing about the survey format was that it immediately um, allowed us to atomize the content. It was, it was very effective for that because, you know, each question, the answer to the, each question could in its own right become a blog post or certainly a lot of social content, even an infographic. Um, so in, in that respect, a survey with findings versus, let's say, a long form ebook or white paper or uh, a more technical report, um, it was a much more uh, adaptable piece. In terms of how we reached our, our target audience, um, we already, you know, most of the people that we were targeting, certainly through Outbound, were known to us. It was either our install base and we had contacts and we were able to reach them via email or it was um, prospects that we had previously engaged with or who had engaged with us. So on the outbound piece, it was pretty straightforward. It was your classic outbound email-based um, engagement activity. And the call to action was um, related to some of the learnings from the, uh, the actual survey itself under general umbrella topics like mobility, security, paper to digital transformation, uh, process automation. But what was new on this one was the heavy emphasis on inbound. So that that frankly was was new for uh, for this group within Xerox and certainly as a global activity um, where we you know we, we weren't quite sure you know we were fishing in a very big sea and we weren't quite sure who we were catching uh, but again having that content that could be easily atomized at least enabled us to drive a lot of inbound traffic um, and then obviously the form fill at the, on, in front of the report was where it really started to segment out from being, uh, you know, tire kickers or uh, people who are not necessarily in a buying cycle to, uh, to known customers or people that are on our prospect list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I find interesting too is beyond, you know, the standard cast of characters, so to speak, around inbound marketing, like social, um, you know, search, um, there's also a big uh, PR and media outreach component. And I think you guys got some pretty solid coverage with um, really reputable publications. And I feel like in the B2B world, that's almost um, an area that not a lot of brands really zero in on as an opportunity because they're just really trying to reach um, you know, their target buyers through very direct modes. So I was wondering if you had any particular thoughts on the role of you know, PR in B2B marketing and how you guys kind of approached that and positioned your PR pitches or media pitches so you know, they had that um, that media draw or, um, you know, connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I personally am a big, big believer in PR as a tool for driving top of funnel engagement and, and driving traffic through, um, through sources that, you know, frankly, we would not necessarily know to reach out to directly. Um, Xerox does not issue a lot of press releases. So when we do the wire set up, uh, and this was no exception, but in order for it to meet that internal benchmark of is this press release worthy, obviously the research itself had to had to demonstrate that. Um, so I, I think um, assuming that you meet that that benchmark, the internal benchmark at Xerox of is it newsworthy to the point where we know the the mainstream media will pick it up, as well as the industry aligned uh, publications. Once you get past that, to me, that's, you know, that is such an opportunity for just driving vast quantities of, of inbound activity. And again, you get a lot of uh, social amplification through that, either us amplifying the, um, you know, whatever the publications uh, summary of the findings are, or those publications themselves through their own social channels. Um, so, you know, when, when I map out all of our, um, you know, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel activity, uh, and look at the exposure numbers, PR always blows everything else out of the water in terms of number of potential eyeballs and reach. Well, that's fascinating. And it's definitely something that, um, you know, is present for us being a media company. You know, we, we always rely on, on those, <laughs> those types of engagements. So um, thank you for the insight and inspiration there. I think, um, I think it'll hopefully encourage people to look into the role that it plays at all of those stages. But um, I wanted to go back to 
um, something that you just mentioned in your previous response, the, the balance between, um, you know, ensuring that, you know, the messaging is relevant to the particular industry or role you're trying to reach, but also ensuring, you know, in a way that there's a powerful story to tell. And I feel like in the B2B world, there's a newfound focus or complete, completely new focus on storytelling in content mm -hmm. creation and campaign development. So how did you guys go about weighing that balance? Um, you know, was there a creative process that you had to go through? Was it kind of organic? And um, do you have any recommendations, you know, just based on how well received this campaign was on, on how other brands can weigh that balance? Yeah, this, this campaign again was, uh, it was pretty interesting because it did, it did evolve organically, I have to say. Um, we had never done something like this globally. The research was done in conjunction with, uh, with the marketing team in Europe, never with the intent that it become the foundation for uh, a global fully integrated campaign for one of our largest business segments. Um, so this, this willingness to kind of get in there and try stuff was, uh, was a cornerstone of why this was successful. Uh, the specifics of what worked and what didn't work, um, I think is always, uh, it's always evolving. It's like we can never predict for sure what's, what's going to work. Um, the focus on inbound on this campaign was new for us. So we definitely put a lot of light and heat on that to try and make sure that we had, uh, we had our content atomized and making it relevant. And within that, the storytelling element of it started to, to manifest itself. Much of it was around, you know, helping you address business process challenge or business challenges that you know you already have, whether it's at the very high level, um, helping you make your infrastructure more efficient so you reduce operating costs or improving customer engagement, which are kind of the two pillars of uh, digital transformation or going down one level, talking about security, mobility, uh, workplace of the future, and um, you know, transforming processes so that they're more efficient. Um, but then our, our longer term goal that was kind of running in the background, and this is something that we talked about at the, uh, at the awards as well, this, this idea of really making customer storytelling and customer first um, point of view uh, a, an, an underlying element of everything that we do is um, it's there and we're working, we're iterating forward with that. Um, I, I wouldn't point to this as being a great example of storytelling. I think it was a very successful campaign. The work that we're doing right now in 2017 is, is really honing in on that, um, that customer point of view, both from the messages that we send out and the way we use it, but also soliciting more customer point of view directly. So um, there's a few things that I'm working on as it relates to um, user generated content, where I feel like that's the next step for us. Oh, that's very interesting. And I, and I love Coleman, how this campaign was almost, um, you know, a stepping stone or, you know, a starting point for you guys to um, continue that evolution as a brand and, you know, as a customer first, um, you know, marketing organization. And that's undoubtedly something that so many companies are, are trying to, um, you know, accomplish or, or work towards. But now that we're, you know, a few months since the awards, um, you know, and uh, B2BMX, which took place in February, I'm sure, you know, there have been some new developments around um, the performance of assets within this campaign. So um, I, I love your perspectives as far as, you know, have there been any new results or any new insights into, you know, what formats or, um, you know, derivative assets have performed the best. Like you said earlier, there's always this process of, you know, tracking, understanding and kind of reiterating or, or learning. So I'd love your thoughts into, you know, what, what's been happening since then. Yeah, the, the two big things that come to mind for me in that respect are uh, we, we definitely, I think we did, a, we did a great campaign. I think we deserve to win the award. 
Uh, that's just my opinion. Um, but also along the way, we learned so much. And one of the things that we learned is there are better ways of, of doing an end-to-end -end campaign, especially for uh, a very large, complex um, selling cycle. Um, so one of the things that we're really focusing on this year is mapping out the entire campaign end to end and really ensuring that we've got all the touch points and also uh, within that building in um, like nurture streams branching on the on the process a b testing so more more of the classic you know demand gen activities um, tied to that is the need to have really good real time reporting so if you know something is working, do more of that. If you know something is not working, figure out why. Either stop doing that and do something different or fix some other un underlying problems. Uh, an example of that, comparing the past to, to where we are today, we, we did not really have a good balance between managing the, uh, the inbound um, marketing, uh, the leads, as they came from inbound versus outbound. So if it was somebody that was in our outbound nurture stream, we already had a, a pretty clear process for how to increment their score in Marketo and then uh, drive them through to, uh, to Salesforce as a marketing qualified lead. Inbound was a little less structured. So we had to do, we had to fix a lot of things on the fly. Good news is most of those have been fixed now, but that idea of, you know, really bring it all together and plan upfront as much as possible. And then that also gives you the flexibility of, of doing stuff on the fly as you go along, which is, um, you know, that's, that's the ideal state where you're, you're prepared for the campaign, but you have the, the flexibility to be able to adapt it as you need. That's great. So, so beyond that ability to test, learn, and, and respond in, in a timely fashion, um, are there any other, you know, key takeaways or best practices that you think everyone out there watching right now should take from this campaign and your overall experience? Any any notable lessons learned that you want to share? Well, there there are definitely things that we, as a large company, are um, we're we're I won't say we're struggling with, but we're stepping into more cautiously. Uh, User generated content being an example, or taking that step where you entrust your customers to, to be your voice with the understanding that um, you, know, you, you may not always like what they have to say, but if you're a brand with, um, with a merit and, and a, a reputable history, then by and large, you can trust your customers to reflect that back. Um, so, I, so that's as much an internal activity as it is a, a customer facing activity. People have to feel comfortable that that is a strategy that's not just uh, you know a tactic um, and um, also the use the use of of uh, video within social specifically is something that we're trying to figure out where you know our, our classic videos went from being seven minutes to three minutes to two minutes and now we're just about one minute but it's still not really optimized for, for what we're seeing in social. So uh, building a mentality that uh, not, we don't just, like we, we're very good at atomizing other assets like this report, but not so good at atomizing video. Um, so we're working on a whole series of, of uh, videos that are building on the Brother Dominic Set the Page Free uh, video that we did earlier in the year, riffing on that, but really optimizing them for that short attention span, 5, 10, 15, 20 second. Um, eyeballs on on social media. That's great. Are there any other formats that you guys are thinking about experimenting with? I know we touched on user generated content, video. Is there anything else kind of emerging that you're excited to uh, get your hands on? Anything brewing? Um, yeah, we're we're stepping more into HTML based infographics and content that's that's native within our web platform as opposed to taking somebody off to SlideShare or uh, a different platform. Um, again, for us, a lot of what we're doing this year is just making sure that we've got all of our structures in place so that campaigns can actually run seamlessly across the globe and we've got that that easy handoff. So the the interesting stuff is more around uh, building out our data mart and having better customer intelligence and also um, you know in, engaging with customers in a way that we know is responsive as opposed to just proscribed. 
That's right, Coleman. Well, I'm really excited to see what else is coming up the pike for Xerox. Um, of course, you know, that this past campaign was truly impressive. So um, I'll, I'll be keeping my eyes open to see uh, all the, those new examples of video, user-generated content, and those native experiences. So um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out to chat with me today. I think you shared a lot of really um, insightful, uh, you know, thought perspectives, um, opinions on, you know, content marketing trends, and of course, your uh, Finney award-winning campaign. So thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, thank you for having me. Bye. And and uh, for anyone out there who is interested in um, submitting their own content for uh, the Killer Content Awards, uh, nominations are now open for uh, 2018. So you should be uh, seeing that short link on the screen below, and we'll be promoting that uh, across social um, in, in the near future. So um, if you think your content is finny worthy, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, thanks everyone out there for watching. We hope you have a great day.